Welcome to Slight Reliability. Learning SRE one day at a time. I'm Stephen Townsend. Welcome back to Slight Reliability. I'm Stephen Townsend. The last week I was off work because I had COVID and it was not very fun. Even after having had uh, two vaccinations and a booster, it was still a pretty nasty cold and a few aches. Uh, but I'm back in back in gear and ready to uh, ready to work again and to produce some more content. Uh, today's episode is all about bad observability. What are the anti patterns? The things that we should avoid, if possible, when we are monitoring and logging and tracing. So to start that off, let's clarify what do people mean when they say observability. Now, as far as I'm concerned, it's just a catch-all term for monitoring, logging, tracing, and events. Anything that we do to observe technology and customers fits into the realm of observability. Even active things that we do, such as synthetics. So I've got some points about the anti-patterns which make up bad observability. Now, let's be clear. Every organization is different. Your context is unique. I may mention an anti-pattern here, which might help you in some way, even just in the short term. But on the whole, most organizations will find that these anti-patterns hurt them. Okay, so the first anti-pattern which I've identified, I've titled forgetting the customer. So from my experience, most organizations are very good at capturing a lot of technical metrics about their systems and their services but often really struggle to answer basic questions like what is the customer experience right now? What are the customers doing? What's their behavior right now? What is the impact of the change we made last night on the customer? Not being able to answer those questions is a big problem because if we don't know the impact of the changes we're making and what the customers, the people that are actually building the software for are doing, then we are lacking crucial information. We're not getting a feedback loop. We're building and operating something, but we don't know whether we're succeeding or not. Now, in in the world of SRE, there are service level objectives, SLOs, which I think pretty much were designed for this purpose so that we're building in customer focus around reliability and performance from the start. We're constantly tracking it and we're constantly getting feedback about it. That's a great thing to have. Whether you call it SLOs or whether you do something different, it doesn't matter. Go back to the outcome. We want to understand whether we're meeting the level of service that we set out to for the customer. Let's track it, let's understand it, let's build it and let's get feedback on it so we can update it and change it if we need to. And I guess part of it as well is let's raise the the priority or the profile of reliability in the first place rather than just constantly pushing out Features. Tracking the customer should be that first line of defense. It's it's the first layer that you're validating, hey, this is the level of service we're giving the customer. And then if there's a problem there, then you look deeper. That's when you need all your technical metrics and your distributed tracing and all the fancy observability stuff that we do. But if we don't know whether the customer's impacted or not, then we're in the dark. It is entirely possible to be monitoring all of the system and service metrics and see a problem, but the customers are fine. And it's equally as possible to be monitoring the customers and see there's a problem, but all the technical metrics look okay. So what's more important? I think the first most important thing is to understand the customer because that's the real target, the, the, the thing we've built it for, the thing we need to understand the most. I mean, bottom line, systems don't pay us money, customers do. Systems don't improve the reputation of our organization, people do. So let's focus on them first. A couple of things worth mentioning here is that understand who your customer is first. You could be a team who provides a service for your colleagues, for other teams in the organization. They are your customers. You need to think about the level of service you want to provide them. It's not the end customer who might be five steps away because you don't have direct control over that customer. You have control over the customer you're provide, your direct customer. 
And the second thing is I have this terrible analogy that I, I've thought of, and I'm just going to say it anyway because it might help someone understand. Let's say that you're trying to figure out whether someone is unhappy, okay? So the customer focus monitoring would be actually talking to the person and saying, and, and saying, hey, how are you feeling? What's going on in your life right now? And actually talking, getting direct feedback from that person. But most of the time, we have this system level monitoring, which is kind of like doing a bunch of blood tests to figure out whether the customer is uh, happy or not. And you might pick up something like a, an iron deficiency or something, which might implicitly, you know, somewhere along the line contribute to someone being unhappy, but you're not getting direct feedback. You're not directly seeing the correlation between these two things. And then there's that other layer of distributed tracing and detailed monitoring to diagnose issues. That's like doing a biopsy to figure out whether someone is happy or not, right? I guess my point is let's talk to the customer before we start chopping people open. Oh, that's such a terrible analogy, but I've said it now, it's done. <laughs> Moving on. Observability anti-pattern number two, building dashboards that no one ever uses. I see this all the time. I log into a tool, an APM tool maybe, or a Splunk, and there are just hundreds and hundreds of dashboards all over the place focusing on all kinds of technical metrics that nobody understands and no one ever looks at them. And there's two problems with that. Well, the first thing is, in SRE there's this concept of, of noise to signal ratio, right? SRE is all about trying to narrow in on the signal. So within monitoring or observability, the signal is the, the information which can provide insight, the thing that we can act on, the thing which is valuable and tells us about the customer or tells us about an issue. The noise is everything else. So it's very, it's part of monitoring. We collect a whole bunch of stuff and very little of it is actually valuable to us at any given point in time. So having a bazillion dashboards creates a whole bunch of noise and does not help us narrow in on the signal. But also every dashboard requires maintenance. There is technical debt required to build and maintain these dashboards and keep them up to date. Not only that, uh, I have heard, and I cannot confirm this, if you're with a cloud provider, that every dashboard that you build costs you money. So you may be paying for a bunch of dashboards that aren't providing any value. What I want to see is a view counter on every dashboard so you can see whether people are actually looking at it. Maybe a, a view counter over time so you can see, are people still looking at it? They may have looked at it for a one week period last year when we were investigating an issue, but it's no longer valuable. So maybe we can decommission that. And we can get people to rather than rely on dashboards being there for everything to actually investigate and query data because that's where we need to move because you can't build a dashboard for every possible thing that might go wrong because the things that might go wrong, we don't know about in advance. I think that pretty much sums that one up. Let's stop building a bazillion dashboards that no one ever looks at. Dashboards are not the answer. They are a tool, which can be helpful in some situations. Anti-pattern number three, inconsistency across environments, particularly between production and uh, non-production or pre-production environments. Uh, so why is it a bad thing? Why is it a bad thing to have a different kind of monitoring in pre-production to production? There's lots of reasons. And this is a big thing for me. It's, I'm, I'm quite passionate about this because I see this a lot. The first thing is, if you have a bunch of observability which is in production and you don't have it in your pre-prod environments, then your, your ops team and your development team and everyone, no one is getting a chance to practice beforehand. So we're just expecting to go into production and know how to use these tools and these processes which we've never practiced before, maybe apart from a game day here and there. It's a huge missed opportunity to build familiarity with these tools and these processes and these ways of working. However, if you do have the same monitoring and alerting and logging and tracing between all your environments and between production and pre-production, I do understand alerting does have to be different. You can still alert on all the same things, but have 
have those alerts go to a, a different place than production, right? You don't want people waking up at three in the morning to deal with an alert in a dev environment, right? It's, that's not the outcome. You can still have the same alerts, just send them to the appropriate place. The other thing is that observability tooling can actually impact performance and reliability. So if you only have it all in your prod environment, you may have production reliability issues, incidents, because you didn't get a chance to test and find them in pre-production. So there's another good reason to have consistency in your monitoring and observability tools across all of your environments if possible. I understand there's real world limitations, licensing fees and so on, but if your tools are exorbitantly expensive and you're only able to have them in production, maybe there's a good use case there to say, you know, uh, to say, you know what, this tool isn't working for us because we want to be able to familiarize ourselves and build a, a culture around doing observability in pre-production as well. Observability anti-pattern number four, misunderstanding metrics. And I've got some examples here. My favorite or least favorite, you could say, is tracking available memory on a server, so RAM, primary memory. And we might see that available memory has hit uh, 1% left, you know, it's 99% full. And you go, ah, there's a problem. We're out of memory. We need more memory. Not necessarily. All available memory is telling us is how much truly free memory there is that isn't allocated to any process. Processes can still hold memory, have it allocated to them, but it's still free, freed up for anyone else to use. So just because available memory is low, it doesn't mean there's a memory problem. And just because available memory is running out doesn't mean there's a memory leak. It doesn't make any sense. Applications are designed to take memory to make themselves more efficient, especially database servers. Now, if you really want to track memory, and let's use Java as an example, look at heap memory usage and whether it is uh, renewably collecting memory and going back to the same position or whether it's tracking upwards. So you need to get into the platform and the application level to actually understand whether memory is a problem. It's almost pointless to track percentage available memory. Almost pointless. And if you are going to track it, at least understand what it means and what it doesn't mean. So that's the first one. The second one happened quite recently. I was talking to someone who looks after a quite a large Kubernetes cluster, the, the platform um, that other teams host their apps on. And we were talking about CPU, monitoring CPU usage. And they said they only care about maximum CPU consumption. And I thought about that for, for a second and realized well, that doesn't make any sense. So let's say over a, you're sampling over a one minute period. Okay, so you're, you've got your sam one minute sampling period and every second or that you're taking CPU usage. And over that one minute, for 59 seconds, the CPU usage is 0%. And then for one second, it bursts up to 100%. And so if you look at the max, you're just going to see 100% and be completely misinformed about what the CPU is doing and how loaded it is. So in the case of CPU, I think there's a good argument that average over a sampling period is a good metric. It's telling us about how loaded the CPU is on average over that time. It makes sense to me. On the point of sampling intervals, that's also a way that we can misunderstand metrics. So let's say, I've seen this before, you might be tracking CPU usage per 10 minutes and be looking at it and say, oh, over each 10 minute period, the CPU usage, it doesn't go above 10%. But you may be completely missing the point that there are one minute periods or 30 second periods in there when CPU could be burning 100% and your customers are suffering because of it. So picking the appropriate sampling interval is also very important. And sampling intervals that are too small are also a problem. So if you're seeing down to like one second and you're like every single little burst your CPU is doing, it's great to have all that information, but you kind of need to aggregate it to see if there's a problem which is lasting. It's all about queuing. If the CPU is busy for a prolonged period of time, that means that the work that needs to be done is going to start queuing up. 
But if it happens in tiny little bursts now and again, the customer's probably never going to notice it. Sometimes too much detail is hindering us from seeing the pattern. And then there is averages and percentiles, uh, any kind of aggregation as well. So misunderstanding how to interpret those. So in the case of latency or response time, average is often a pretty poor aggregate. And so is percentile in a lot of cases. As you would have known if you've seen any of my performance engineering talks and blogs, I often talk about the importance of raw data to see patterns of behavior and what a system is doing. An average and a percentile or any kind of aggregate can hide those patterns. But we kind of rely on them as well because we can't always look at the raw data all the time. So I've given some examples, but it's not the examples that matter. The important message is that we need to understand the metrics that we're using and what they mean and what they don't mean, because otherwise we're going to be led to the wrong conclusion and we might make decisions which cause us problems or are ineffective. Nobody wants that. So we're 16 minutes in and I feel like I've only just started to scratch the surface. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna finish this episode as part one of bad observability and come back next week with part two where I will start to shift the focus away to culture and organization and anti-patterns of observability across those lenses. And it will give me an opportunity to re-clarify anything I mentioned in this episode if I need to elaborate or if I said something completely wrong, which is entirely possible. So that's it for this week of Slight Reliability. I'll be back next week with the second part of the series on bad observability.